The gilding and high marble polish of this statuette clearly evoked the aesthetics of another sculptural medium, small-scale gold and ivory statuary. Such so-called chrysanthemum statuary was one of the most celebrated media of classical sculpture, especially for images of the gods. Think of Phidias's image of Athena that was originally housed in the Parthenon on the Athenian Acropolis. Examples of such precious works rarely survive for obvious reasons, but an important exception, albeit fragmentary, is this exquisitely carved ivory foot here in the Metropolitan Museum from a statuette of a, simi of a similarly seated divinity, perhaps in this case, the Egyptian god Serapis. One of the icons of the Metropolitan's collections of Greek and Roman sculpture is the, the so-called Old Market Woman, the single extant Roman replica of a Hellenistic statue. A woman is represented bent with age in a strikingly realistic style with teeth missing and sagging breasts. Small traces of pink color were noted on the border of the Hemation when the piece entered the museum in 1909, but these were subsequently described to be no longer visible, and references to this painting dropped out of the literature on this important piece. New examination has revealed not only vestiges of a pink pigment, but also a heretofore unnoted additional blue pigment above. So we'll go into areas here. You'll see some more blue pigment here, pink pigment here. That'll become more clear here. An ongoing and concurrent program of research suggests that both the pink and blue pigments appear to have been mixed with lead white in a painterly technique in the Greek tradition. The large-grained blue pigment is almost certainly Egyptian blue. The pink pigment appears to be an organic red dye stuff, and one would suspect it is an antiquinone, a type often found precipitated onto white clay and then used as a, pig as a pigment. One might conclude then that the old market woman wore a modest garment that had a pink border and a blue band above. More recently, however, new examinations by uh, a new portable X-ray fluorescent spectrometer that we have here at the museum has indicated that the brown crust that we see here is in fact rich in lead white and appears to be original ancient polychromy where the organic pink colorant has faded. So we have what's particularly fascinating is that in looking at the surface of the sculpture, and I would encourage all of you to do this, um, you will find that there are areas of what has traditionally been identified as a burial accretion is in fact original polychromy that has been transformed and is easily, um, could easily be confused with ancient polychromy. And I think this is really an illustration of how materials analysis allows us to look at these sculptures anew in the sense that it is not simply a process of looking for uh, colored materials on the surfaces that we encounter, but also doing a, a really sort of fine-tuned material analysis of the, albeit often unpromising, remains that survive on the surfaces of these sculptures and thereby enriching our understanding of them. This may seem, like I mentioned, as like a minor detail, but actually the understanding of this garment has an important bearing on our broader understanding of the identity of the old market woman. She has often been described as an aged, destitute genre figure, as a kind of anonymous urban urchin found in the new populous cities of the Hellenistic world, such as Alexandria. The extant polychromy, however, suggests that this is not a poor elderly woman hawking her wares, which are carried in her left hand, a basket of fruit and fowl. Rather, as more recently proposed, this is an elder wearing her Sunday best, if you will, participating in a Dionysiac festival. Here, the colorful, luxurious attire 
befitting for the god, appears to have been deliberately and powerfully contrasted with her physique to create not a portrait of humility and hardship, but rather an image testifying to the transformative power of the god Dionysus. You can make even the aged and infirm forget their cares on common festival days known as Hilaria. My point is simply that even a little bit of evidence can significantly add to our understanding of familiar works of classical sculpture. The painted polychromy of this piece reminds us that painting itself was one of the most celebrated arts of classical Greece. And Greek painters of the fifth century and fourth centuries BC developed revolutionary methods of representation that are fundamental to the Western pictorial tradition, such as three-dimensional perspective, the use of light and shade to render form, and trompe l'oeil realism. It has long been recognized that these stylistic developments were intimately related to Greek advances in the materials and techniques of painting. But as the evidence of original Greek painting from this period is extremely limited, so too is our understanding of the interrelationship between style and technique. A group of six painted funerary monuments, three of which I show you here, discovered in Alexandria in Egypt, dating from the late fourth and third centuries BC, form an exceptional rare body of such Greek painting. The preserved surfaces of these monuments are, relatively speaking, exceptionally well preserved because they remained in, a, in the protected environment of a subterranean tomb for more than 2,000 years before they were discovered in 1884, shortly after which they were donated to this museum. The focus of the painting on each of the monuments is the deceased. Here, a man wearing a yellow robe is seated at center. He clasps the hand of a woman standing before him, dressed in a pale robe and mantle. Another man wearing a purple robe stands behind. Note how the shift in the background color from gray to purple focuses the composition and our attention to the joined hands of the man and woman. This is a scene of quiet, intimate, final farewell that has close parallels with Athenian sculpted grave reliefs of the fourth century BC. In a smaller, more braided funerary slab, you can discern the standing figure of a Galatian mercenary against a solid yellow background. He stands at ease, wearing a blue mantle and holding a spear and tall shield. An inscription identifies him as Vitos, son of Lostoyax, and he is represented in the less emotional, more public language of, civic, of, of public civic statuary and its commemoration. More innovative is the composition and design of this well-preserved painted funerary slab of Pelospides, a Thessalian mercenary who, like Vitos, was employed in the royal Ptolemaic army. He wears a belted yellow tunic and is represented in a moment of action, struggling and succeeding to bridle an unruly horse while an attendant looks on. Recent examinations and analysis have revealed that these paintings employ a similar, highly sophisticated technique. The recessed picture panel of each was prepared with a lead white ground to create a flat, uniform, and brilliant white surface, a preparation technique undoubtedly transferred from contemporary wooden panel painting. And it should be recalled that even the use of lead white in painting was a Greek in a technical innovation of this period. After black preparatory drawing, the painting was built up on subtle colors through overlapping, uh, through sequences of overlapping pigment applications. 